I've met I've seen them. Uh, so let's start then. So uh, today, so last time we, we introduced Bell's theorem. Now we all know what Bell's theorem is saying and uh, have some idea of its of this kind of sweep of ideas that's led to uh, where we are now and uh, such a, plays such a central role in quantum information, in fact. Um, today I want to look at the same kind of uh, paradox quasi-paradoxical situations, borders of paradox situations arising in contextuality from a, um, a, a different perspective uh, and to show that there is topology there, uh, really quite close to the surface. I'm not going to go into full depth in that. Um, I'll mention, if, if you are interested in pursuing that strand, I'll, I'll mention some uh, things that come out of it. But the nice thing is we'll really be able to see the topological structure because these sort of examples are relatively small and uh, highly visualizable. And we'll see that there are connections with quite classic topics in, in, in logic, in the study of paradoxes and also in some issues that have arise in contemporary model theory as well. And then I'm going, having, you know, we, we've been looking at examples, but then what I'll do in the latter part of the lecture is introduce a general setting where we can uh, look at a wide, uh, really an adequately wide range of examples in a uniform way. And we'll be using that for the remainder of the, of the lectures. So let me sort of briefly review uh, some of what we said at the end of yesterday's lectures. So observables on the realist uh, point of view uh, are reflecting objective properties of a physical system independent of our choice of which measurements to perform. And what that's saying is that for each possible state of the system, there's a function which tells you what the value of each measurement that you could perform on the system would be, independently of which other measurements may be performed. And this is the point of view is called non-contextuality. And it's really equivalent to the assumption of a classical source. We don't have to believe that the world is deterministic, but we do have to believe that it's determinate. <laughs> Um, so what I mean is that the, what, what the lambda is um, could itself be chosen according to some probability distribution. There could be a stochastic process driving what we see, but um, the, um, the, 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 what this, uh, the space over which this stochastic process ranges is globally assigning well-defined values to all the variables that we could measure. So this is the idea of non-contextuality. Non non <coughs> and it's this view which is impossible to sustain in the light of our actual observations of reality at the microscopic level. And this is what we were discussing yesterday and the impressive experiments that have now been performed. So here's the sort of um, uh, a picture essentially relating to the exposition by David Mermin from uh, some 20 years ago. Uh, so we think of the, the source as generating the, these what Mermin called instruction sets, uh, the, the values for all the measurements that we might be performing. Of course, there could be you know, infinitely many measurements, but here we're, we, we, only, we, we can already uh, witness these phenomena with finitely many measurements and finitely many possible values of the measurements. So everything works in a very finitary way. Um, and we have Alice and Bob here, and they're, uh, they're performing their measurements. Uh, and this would be the picture if the non-contextual view held sway. And the point is that we know that it doesn't. So here is one of the examples we discussed uh, last time. Uh, and it's, it is usually called the Hardy paradox. So again, we see the term paradox being used. And the point of this, introduced by Lucien Hardy uh, about 1992, was to have a form of Bell's theorem without probability. So we, our original derivation following the style of Bell and, and the people who came afterwards in particular, the, um, uh, it's often coupled with CHSH, Clauser, Horn, Shimoni and Holt, who really introduced the typical uh, inequality that's, that's the most widely used. Um, but we saw that that was an inequality based on the quantitative information coming from probabilities. And we saw in our discussion of Hardy's paradox last time that we could make the argument um, that there must be, that there can't be a classical source, 
by showing that a bell inequality must be violated even without knowing what the probabilities are, just from knowing the support. And now I want to take this a step further and say that we can make a direct argument at the logical level that doesn't go by way of an inequality. And actually now, not only do we only need the support, we don't even need all 16 entries. We only need four. If we have these four, that's sufficient to show that there can't be a classical source. So this is really the minimum that we need for the argument. <clears throat> So um, let's just be clear about what these things are saying. It's the same Alice-Bob arrangement here are the, um, uh, for the settings. Here are the possible outcomes. And this is saying that uh, the probability of getting this joint outcome for these measurements is in the support, so it has a positive probability, whereas these are not in the support, so they have probability zero. In other words, these are impossible this is possible, so we're speaking at the level of possibilities, and that's all we need in order to make the argument. Now, let's say there was a classical source, a probability distribution over instruction sets, which generated a table like this, generated a more detailed table which we could project down to this information. What would it have to do? Well, it would, uh, since this thing is possible, there must be some instruction set in the support of that classical source distribution which would, uh, which would have positive probability. There must be some lambda uh, which, which, uh, which is possible according to the classical source. So what could this lambda be? Well, we know what it has to assign to these two variables and it has to assign zero to both of them because this thing is in the support. What values does it assign to the other variables? And this is the point that came out in the in the uh, discussion yesterday, as, as Peter was uh, mentioning, that, that the point about non-contextuality or the realist point of view is that you know, the tree's in the quad even if we don't look at it. So everything has a well-defined value whether we're, whether we're measuring it or not. So this lambda has the obligation to assign a definite value to all the variables. So we know it assigns these values to these two, but what does it assign, for example, to uh, the variable b2. Well, it, there are only two things it could assign, 0 or 1. But in, if it assigned this one, then this would also be a possible joint outcome. And this entry here tells us that it isn't. So therefore, we must, we must conclude that the only thing it can assign to b2 is 1. And now we can play the same game again. I mean, now, we, now that we know that b2 gets assigned 1, we can ask what A2 gets assigned. And again, there are two possibilities, 0 or 1. But if it was assigned 1, then this would be a possible outcome. And this thing tells us that it isn't. So that possibility is eliminated. And the only remaining possibility is that A2 gets assigned 0. So now we have a complete specification of what lambda would have to be. However, there is still a constraint that we haven't considered. And, that constra uh, and you can see if lambda assigned these, uh, these possibilities, and in particular, the uh, outcome 0, 0 for A2 and B1 would have to be possible. Lambda is in the support of this distribution sitting in the classical source. But we see that this is precluded. Uh, so therefore, we have to conclude that there is no such lambda, and there can be no classical source. And we can see that essentially, by the way, this is just a constraint satisfaction problem, even at this level, just a satisfiability problem. And we're, we're saying that there's no solution. So From a, or Sudoku. Sorry? It seems like Sudoku, right? Sudoku. Sudoku, yes, yes, right. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, yes. Is Sudoku NP complete? I don't know. Uh, so, um, battleships is, but anyway. So, um, right, so, uh, yes. Um, but it has a, uh, but it's a game that has, in a sense, a profound consequence, because it's telling us that um, we have this information we can directly <laughs> see, but we can't piece it together globally. Um, and um, we can also think of it geometrically. Uh, I'm not going to go very far down this road, but that structure is, is really there just below the surface, and we'll expose a little bit more of it shortly. The, another way of putting this is that there's a local section, namely the assignment to just the variables A1 and B1, which cannot be extended to a global section. 
That, that's what's happening. And these constraints provide an obstruction to extending the local section to a global one. Uh, and actually, this, together with this connection with uh, constraint satisfaction, leads to um, some work with, uh, with Fokion and uh, Georg Gottlob, where we've identified a sort of um, a non-trivial variant of the standard constraint satisfaction paradigm, uh, which, uh, robust constraint satisfaction, where the idea is, can you find a so not just a solution in itself, but a solution which extends certain assigned values to a subset of the variables? And you get a, there's a non-trivial variant of the, 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 the theory of uh, uh, um, uh, and de delineating the tractability boundary for that kind of constraint satisfaction. Anyway, those are kind of side uh, sort of offshoots of uh, this kind of argument. Anyway, the conclusion we draw once again is that Hardy models are contextual. They're paradoxes or at least quasi paradoxes on the borders of paradox in this sense. They cannot be explained by a classical source. So now I want to turn from that kind of logical, really, way of looking at it to, a, to a, a visual way which shows that there is topological structure here, um, which, and we can kind of see it. So here is the Hardy table again. Instead of zeros and ones, I've written ticks and crosses. They mean the same thing. A tick means is possible. Um, a, a, a cross means is impossible. In other words, probability greater than zero or probability zero. And what I want to do now is draw uh, a, a, a geometric diagram, a bundle diagram, uh, which, will, uh, which will convey exactly the information given by this model. Um, so uh, we start by just looking at the variables that we're considering. We think of this as a kind of base space, where the space of the context. So we have A, B, A prime, B prime, the two settings for Alice and the two settings for Bob. And we introduce edges, and the idea is that there's an edge between two variables if they can be measured together. So we can measure A with B or with B prime. Alice, this is the significance of Alice and Bob being independent. Alice can make a choice, Bob can make a choice in any combination. But we cannot measure A together with A prime. Alice has to choose a spin direction or a... Um, angle for uh, polarization uh, or whatever it is um, and can't measure two different directions at the same time with her particle. So that's the, that's the very simple structure we have here for the base space. And now we're going to have fibers and the fibers simply give the possible values that each variable can get, which in this case is just zero or one in each case. And now we're going to draw edges between values in the fibers if they can appear together as possible joint outcomes. So you see on the front face here, corresponding to this first row, all joint outcomes are possible, so we have four edges. Whereas uh, on the A prime B face, we have three possible joint outcomes and one that's impossible, so we have three edges. And similarly on this face and this face. So this is now um, a, a, bundle, a little bundle diagram uh, uh, which conveys exactly the information we have from the table. But now there's a lot of information that's immediately um, geometrically apparent. Firstly, what does local consistency mean in this, um, uh, in this picture? What it means is that if I start um, with an edge, one of these local sections as it were, I, there's always a way of continuing. If I'm, if I'm on an edge and I look at the, um, at the um, there's always some edge abutting on the vertex at either end of the edge that I start with. Why does this correspond to local consistency? Here we're just dealing, not, I mean, we, we said yesterday that, that local consistency for probability distributions meant having common marginals. Here we're only speaking of possibilities. So uh, what it means is to say that um, if, uh, an outcome from Alice's point of view is possible in a given context, um, then it should stay possible even if Bob were to change which measurement he made. That's what, that's what it means. But you see that um, um, di uh, diagrammatically here, what this means is that, for, well, here, let's say, if the outcome uh, zero is possible for Bob when he makes the measurement B, in the context where Alice makes the measurement A, well, it shouldn't depend on which measurement Alice makes. So there should be some 
uh, when Alice makes the measurement a prime, there should be some outcome which is jointly possible with this zero, um, which still makes it possible from Bob's point of view. And that's exactly saying that we can continue uh, the path. So locally, a path can be always be continued. And that's the, that's the sense in which this data is locally consistent. What does global consistency mean? Global consistency means that we can, we can form a complete closed path that assigns a unique value to every variable. As it were, a univocal path where we get a unique value assigned to each variable. And you can see that this diagram does contain such a path which, which assigns um, a unique value to all of the four variables. But the sense in which this is uh, contextual is that there exists some edge which cannot be extended to such a univocal path. And actually, this is the edge. So this is the one that we saw from, from out here, starting up 0, 0 on this front face. So we can try and extend it. So we know we can always locally extend the path. That's the local consistency. But when we come back, we no longer have the option to get back to where we started. So we don't form uh, a univocal path. And of course, we could go the other way. Um, uh, whoops, I'm going backwards, sorry. Uh, so we could, we could instead go the other way, and again, we don't get back to where we started. So there is no such path that extends that particular section. So that is the sense in which a local section cannot be extended to a global one. Okay, so um, that, is, um, a f and that is a form of contextuality which, as we've seen, is witnessed purely at the level of uh, possibilities, or, if, or we could say purely at a logical level. So we call this uh, possibilistic or logical contextuality. Um, could there be something stronger? Um, and, and the answer is yes, and this will take us towards one of the main points we're going to see in this, uh, in this lecture, which is that contextuality is not an all or nothing notion. You either have it or you don't. There's a natural hierarchy that emerges, actually much more refined than what we'll consider here, but we'll consider the main, the main points in this hierarchy. And the, the examples which have been extensively discussed in the literature indeed exemplify the different points in this hierarchy. So in particular, here is something which witnesses a stronger form of contextuality than the Hardy paradox and indeed the, the original Bell table that we started off with. Uh, and this is, this is a very interesting um, table. Um, called the PR box. It's interesting for several reasons. Um, one, one reason is that although by now we may sort of uh, have difficulty distinguishing you know, science fact from science fiction, uh, whereas the Bell table and the Hardy table are real things that can be realized according to the predictions of quantum mechanics, and those loophole-free Bell tests were essentially realizing uh, some, something pretty much uh, corresponding to the, the Bell table in particular. This, as far as we know, is science fiction, in the sense that this goes beyond what can be achieved in quantum mechanics. So the, the reason I'm using it as an example is because it's, um, it's um, simple and we can easily depict it, but also because it plays a very important role in um, current research. Uh, one of the main reasons now, uh, one of the main things people are trying to understand in quantum information and foundations now is not so much that we have non-locality and contextuality. This is well established, confirmed, of course, by the, the recent loophole-free Bell test, but everyone believed it anyway. But it's to understand why nature, as it seems, gives us this much, namely the quantum uh, possibilities, but no more. And this is an example of something more. When no, you say that it's more, you mean that experiments in that confirmed exist. No, we can actually prove we can actually prove that this cannot be realized in quantum mechanics. Because we can have although there was a Bell inequality for the which which we could think of as a, as a maximum inequality for a maximum success probability for winning that game. Uh, the XOR game that we discussed at the end of yesterday's lectures. And there's something called the Tyrrelson inequality, which gives a maximum value of success probability that can be achieved for that game by any quantum mechanical realization, 0.83. I mean, remember the classical one was 0.75. This one, actually, as you can see, is a winning strategy. It has success probability one, because the support 
which again is what's being indicated here, the support uh, is exactly corresponding to the winning conditions for the XOR game. Those are exact, there's nothing more. So therefore the whole weight of the probability distributions uh, is on the winning, uh, winning positions. So it achieves the algebraic maximum of four for our logical Bell inequality uh, and it's a winning strategy for the XOR game. There's another interesting point about this PR box, which we'll come back to a little later, which is that, that although I haven't written it, well, this is just possibilities, but actually given that we have local, the local consistency condition, the no signaling condition, actually this is already sufficient to determine the probabilities uniquely. But we'll, we'll come back to that point. Anyway, what I want to do now is to show you the PR box from the same point of view of the bundle diagram. And this is very, this immediately hits the eye. It's a kind of discrete Mebius strip. And what you can see immediately uh, is just with the same, the same conventions that we were using before. We have the base, the fibers, and the edges. And you can see that uh, there is no univocal path at all in this diagram. Wherever you start from, you're never going to come back assigning unique values to all the variables to where you, where you started out from. So uh, this is what we call uh, um, strong contextuality, in fact. Uh, now, as I've said, this PR box is, prov well, is provably not realizable in quantum mechanics, and, as far, and we have no reason to believe it's realizable in nature because everything tells us that what nature realizes is what quantum mechanics predicts. Um, but the same four extra strength of contextuality is manifested in quantum mechanics. The thing is we need to go to more parties in order to see it, which makes it harder to draw. So there's a very famous example in the, in the literature, the, the, so the Greenberger Horn Zeilinger state, which manifests strong contextuality. So just to, um, yeah, so I will, we'll say this again, but I mean just to say that the idea is that the bell table, we really needed probabilities and we couldn't make the argument just in terms of possibilities. With the Hardy, uh, so that's the weakest form of contextuality. Um, with the Hardy table, we, we could prove that, that probabilistic form of contextuality, but we only needed possibilities to do it. And we had this idea of a local section that could not be extended to a global assignment to all the variables. And then with the strongest form, exemplified by the PR box or in quantum mechanics by this greenberger horn zeilinger state, uh, we have the strongest form where there is no way of assigning values to all the variables simultaneously, which is consistent with the model. That's extremely strong. How many parties do you need on that? Sorry? How many parties? The GH? Three. Three parties. Yeah. So provably, for at least with the limitations of two measurements and um, uh, two outcomes, uh, the only strongly contextual models in, that, in those dimensions are these, the PR box and various relabelings of it, and none of those are quantum realizable, which shows that there's something about that case that is not really typical, because as soon as you go up to three parties, each with two measurements, each with two outcomes, you get this GHZ state, and it is quantum realizable, and you do get this phenomenon. And it's to do uh, with being on... Um, a vertex of a suitable polytope, or you know, it's, we'll, we'll see more about that later on. Okay, so let me briefly say, make a connection with the classic discussion of paradoxes in logic, because surely if we look at this PR box, it's quite evocative of uh, uh, various kinds of uh, paradoxical arguments. So here's, uh, so we have the classic liar paradox, but we, we have more generally people discuss liar cycles, a chain of sentences, each saying the next is true, uh, and the last one saying the first one is false. Um, and we can think of it in terms of um, um, uh, equations. I mean, there's been a lot of recent discussion of paradoxes in terms of uh, equ uh, Boolean equations, which is quite a nice way of discussing them. So we can think of these things uh, as fibered over the variables they refer to. Um, and what we see is that any n minus 1 of these equations is consistent and the whole set is inconsistent. And the point is that the Lyer cycle of length 4 corresponds exactly to the PR box. So in that sense, the PR box is directly corresponding to a very classic uh, topic in um, uh, logic. 
And in fact, the usual reasoning to derive a contradiction from the liar corresponds to the attempt to find a univocal path in the bundle diagram. So, you know, the usual way you'd say is, well, assume that one of the variables is true, and then you propagate the constraints locally around. And because of this fact that the path doesn't bring you back to where you started, you end up with the opposite value for the variable you started off with. And then you try the other one, so going the other way around, and you end up with the same result. So it's really uh, a familiar theme in logic, but has exactly this uh, topological uh, uh, way of looking at it. So there's much more that could be said on this topological theme. I mean, firstly, it, it sort of all extends much more generally. We're going to look at the general framework now. But actually, one can use uh, the formalism of sheaves and sheaf cohomology to give witnesses for contextuality. It's a very nice story, but I'm not going to go into it in these, in these talks. If anyone's uh, interested, uh, uh, be delighted to discuss it. And uh, Rui has also worked on this. Shane Mansfield, who'll be, he'll be here later in the program. OK, I thought I'd mention one other connection with uh, uh, logic, um, which I feel there's more there, possibly. And it would be, again, would be nice to explore it. So here is one of the classic uh, theorems of, uh, of logic, closely related to the Craig interpolation lemma. When I gave a Berkeley logic colloquium a couple of years ago, um, um, I, I, a distinguished senior gentleman in the audience at the end of the lecture was explaining to his neighbor the relation between the Robinson consistency theorem and the Craig interpolation lemma. And I later learned that this was the 97 or, um, year old William Craig. So it was a nice moment. OK, so here's the Robinson joint consistency theorem. So we have a couple of theories. If there's no sentence in the intersection of the languages, the vocabularies of these theories, where, they, where, where we have a contradiction between the two theories, then we can form their union. So that's the Robinson joint consistency theorem in a fairly standard formulation. Now, that's a binary result. So a natural question. Um, uh, it says that two compatible theories can be glued together. In this binary case, local consistency implies global consistency. Natural question, what goes happens beyond the binary case? Which is never discussed in books as far as I know. But there's a very good reason why it's not discussed in books, because it would be false. Uh, so here is a minimal counterexample. Just at the propositional level, three theories, each pairwise locally compatible, but if you put all three together, they're inconsistent. And this actually correlates to um, a classic example due to, um, which is often known as the Specker, Specker triangle, uh, which is really um, a sort of just saying, uh, can, I, can I just color the vertices of the triangle uh, in such a way that the, um, so it's, it's really just the basic case of the odd length cycle, I guess, that Anuj was uh, talking about yesterday. Can I color this with two colors in such a way that uh, the, the edges are, uh, um, the adjacent vertices don't have the same color? So actually, this would be the simplest proof of what's known as the Koch and Specker theorem, except that again, this triangle cannot be realized in quantum mechanics. So instead, uh, Cochin and Specker had to construct an example with 117 vectors in their famous 1965 paper, and that number uh, vectors in three space, and and that number has since been reduced to uh, to 31. In the example at the bottom of the screen, should yeah. those implications be biconditionals? Yes, they should. Yes, yes. Actually, you're quite right, and I I um, um, I, I forgot to correct that. Yes, thank you. Yes. Right. Um, so, um, yeah. So again, there's a, a, a sort of a connection there. And um, uh, I, I, I then, uh, so it seems that some of the, the work that model theorists have been doing recently on uh, amalgamation results um, some of it is quite close to these kind of considerations, conditions under which amalgamation is possible. So I had some nice discussions with um, John Baldwin and uh, Andres Villaveches uh, last year, and they, they pointed out some references that had examples 
which were surprisingly close to some of the some of the things I've been discussing here. So again, there may be interesting things to explore there, uh, sort of connections between amalgamation ideas in current model theory and um, um, uh, some of these issues. Okay, so now what I want to do is. Um, <clears throat> We've really been discussing examples, but I want to set up some gener a general framework in which we can discuss these things. And the nice point is that all the concepts lift in a fairly effortless way to this general level, uh, which is general enough to cover all the, all the usual things that are discussed in the, um, uh, in the, in the literature, in, in, in quantum information, and, and possibly more things as well. So uh, the first ingredient is the sort of syntactic component, um, as it were, the corresponding to the, the vocabulary in, 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 a, in, a, in a model theory terms or the schema in database terms is what we call a measurement scenario. So it's the structure of the measurement, the fact that we had in our examples Alice and Bob and they had various choices of measurements and so on. So the ingredients are a set of variables that label the measurements that can be performed. And we think of these as variables that can be measured or observed or evaluated. And then um, a family of sets of variables, which are those that can be measured together. And these, these form the contexts. So we could be a little more general and um, just say there's a relation between an abstract set of contexts and a set of variables. But here we, we're just saying that if two contexts have exactly the same variables measurable in them, then uh, we regard them as the, as the same. So we just identify contexts with sets of variables. Um, and we have a set of possible outcomes or values for the variables. So um, as an example, let's see how we can reconstruct the Bell uh, scenario. Alice, Bob, each with two measurements, each measurement with two outcomes in this form. So the set of variables is what we expect. The measurement context are those measurements that can be made together. In other words, any choice of measurement by Alice together with any choice of measurement by Bob. Um, so these, we have four contexts and the outcomes are just zero, one. So this is in an obvious way the um, covering that kind of example. And you can see that it would be quite easy to extend this to any number of parties any number of measurements for each party, and any number of outcomes for each measurement. So it uh, deals with all kinds of multipartite Bell scenarios. But it deals, with, um, it deals with more things as well. I mean, we just mentioned Coach and Specker constructions. Um, this is uh, one of the, uh, often uh, uh, sort of by Cabello and uh, colleagues, is one of the simplest uh, and standard ways of presenting a Coach and Specker construction. This is with respect to four dimensions. So um, in that case, 18 variables suffice. But you see, it's a, quite an intricate structure. So the context, so this is the set X is the set of 18 variables represent, uh, labeled by these letters. And the cover, the, set, the family of subsets, is this set of nine sets of variables, each one containing four variables. The significance of this combinatorial structure is that we can label each of these 18 letters by a unit vector in R4, such that each column forms an orthonormal basis of R4. And um, as far as the combinatorial structure is concerned, if you look carefully, you may notice that each letter occurs in exactly two contexts. And between the fact that each letter occurs in two contexts and that there are nine contexts, we can make, a, we can make an argument to show the appropriate form of strong contextuality for um, a construction based on this. So the main reason I'm showing this now is to show that things can be as combinatorially intricate. Uh, um, uh, I mean, that this covers a wealth of uh, intricate examples. Perhaps another point worth making is that when we, when we talk about this family of uh, subsets, so it's a hypergraph, um, there are two uh, you, um, things that turn out to be useful in practice to do and a certain amount of uh, sort of moving back and forth between them. What we most often do is, fo is focus on the maximal uh, sets of compatible variables. So you get a family of the maximal context, which then none of which is included in any other by definition. So you get a... Um, 
a kind of irredundant representation that way. On the other hand, if you have a set of variables that's compatible, you do expect any subset also to be compatible. So the other way of looking at this is that it's an abstract simplicial complex, and this is useful for developing the uh, topological uh, point of view, which I was mentioning earlier. So it's, and, and the other thing I should say is that for, for most purposes, we take these things to be finite because most of the examples considered in quantum information are naturally of that nature. And if you think about what you can build in the lab, what any protocol would involve, what any circuit would involve, um, the number of measurements and um, so on would be finite. So then you can pass without loss of information between the uh, abstract simplicial complex point of view and the just looking at the maximal um, context. Okay, so that's the first ingredient, the kind of schema level. And then the sort of instance or structure level is what we call the, um, is what we call empirical models. So the terminology comes from a um, paper by Adam Brandenberger and um, Arsen Janowski. And um, um, it's a good name because um, um, one of the important points about contextuality is that it's in the data. We make these observations and then whether it's contextual or not is structure that's there in the data. We don't have to presuppose any underlying physical theory. This turns out to be a really important point of view in contemporary, um, in sort of quantum cryptography, where uh, people talk about device independent quantum cryptography, where you don't have to trust what the box that you've been given is doing. You don't even have to believe that it's obeying the laws of quantum mechanics. And you can just rely on the fact that typically Bell inequalities are violated. And that red gives you a good enough um, um, guarantee that, I mean, to secure your, uh, your cryptographic uh, properties. So uh, these tables uh, can represent um, what arises purely from observation. On the other hand, of course, quantum mechanics as a predictive theory is precisely an engine for generating um, a family of these, of these tables. And there's a more restrictive class, which are the ones that can be generated using a classical source, which is uh, where we started from. Anyway, what is an empirical model over uh, a measurement scenario? Well, it's simply a family of probability distributions over the one for each, um, so we have for each context the set of possible outcomes for measuring the variables in that context, and then uh, we have a probability distribution over those possible outcomes. So let me just mention this more explicitly. A joint outcome or event in a context is just an assignment of an outcome to each variable in the context. So it's a member of this, uh, it's a function which makes that, it's a value assignment for the variables in the context. And by assigning a probability distribution over all such things, we've said we, we've given, um, I mean, that, that's the way we tabulate data. So it's the, the general uh, form of a probability table. So these distributions are the rows of our generalized probability tables. So if we, if we anatomize a table like the one we saw earlier, as we've already said, the measurement contexts are these. Um, the, uh, the, the entries in the table refer to events, which are these uh, assignments of values to the variables, values in the column to the uh, variables given in the row. Um, and uh, each row of the table specifies a probability distribution. So this is a special case of the general definition, but the general definition can be over any uh, hypergraph. So um, there's a bit of algebraic structure which is really essential then to working with these, uh, with these things. This algebraic structure, I mean, just below the surface is really saying that we have a, we have a pre sheaf um, but I'm, I'm going, I've, I've decategorified these lectures, so I'm not going to speak explicitly of that, um, but, um, we'll, but we'll see that it, it sort of caches out in, 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 in the cases we're interested in to familiar operations like marginalization and projection. So, but we have the idea that's very familiar anyway, that if you have functions on subsets, uh, provided they're compatible, we can glue them together. 
So if the restrictions of these two functions defined on the subsets u and v and with a common codomain uh, agree, then they can be glued to form a function on the big subset. So this is another version of the, the, exact, the same kind of situation that we saw with the um, Robinson thing and many other situations, of course. So this is really the local consistency condition. And the general form of this local consistency condition is what we'll call compatibility. And what we, uh, what, well, the way we, we formalize this is by saying, just as we did for the functions in the familiar example here, that the distributions agree on overlaps. So you can only hope to glue functions together if they, they are consistent to start off with, meaning they agree on their overlap. The same should be true for distributions. So what does, what does restriction uh, mean here? So here's a formula for the, for the restriction of a distribution. But let me just say that we can, if we just write it like this, so we're going to a subset, so we can think of it just as a product, and we're just summing over the things that are not in the, in the factor that we're projecting down to. So we see that this operation of restriction is just marginalization of a probability distribution. Um, I'm only going to be dealing with discrete probabilities in these lectures, but... Um, uh, uh, I think everything does generalize. And uh, after Prakash's lectures, we'll know how to do that. So, um, so compatibility says that the distributions on different contexts have consistent marginals. So it doesn't matter which larger context you are, uh, when you project down to a common subpart, you're gonna get the same thing. Um, now, um, that's a natural, ge geometrically natural condition, a logically natural condition. But it's, used, but it's important also to note that it relates to an important physical principle known as no signaling. And it's this principle which underwrites, uh, despite all the spooky action at a distance and all the rest of it, which nevertheless underwrites the fact that quantum mechanics is consistent with um, uh, special relativity, with the causality structure that we get from relativity. So let's see a particular case that makes this clear. Suppose we're in a context C where Alice can do measurement A, Bob can do measurement B. There's another context where Alice makes the same measurement, Bob is making the measurement B prime. Uh, and Bob may be a long way away from Alice. But under relativistic constraints, Bob's choice of measurement um, should not be able to affect the distribution Alice observes on the outcomes from her measurement of A. Or to put it the other way around, if Alice were able to observe different, um, different frequencies, different uh, probabilities on her outcomes of her local measurement, if it did make a difference, she'd be able to infer something about what, what Bob did, even though there was no time for information about what he chose to do to propagate through to Alice. That would violate relativistic causality. Now, to the constraint that ensures that that doesn't happen uh, is by saying that the distribution on, the, on, on A, as viewed as a subset of AB, marginalizing from the distribution over AB to the distribution on A, should be the same as what we get by marginalizing from the context AB prime. So whether we marginalize from the distribution on the context C or the context C prime, we get the same thing. Uh, and this condition is directly generalized by compatibility. Um, so here is, here is our general uh, compatibility condition for arbitrary shapes of contexts and arbitrary intersections. And this general form, if we interpret things suitably, is uh, satisfied by quantum systems. If compatibility means commuting, uh, observables, then uh, it's always satisfied by quantum mechanics. So this is a nice coincidence of the geometric notion of compatibility agreeing on the overlap with this physical principle of no signaling. It's perhaps useful to really spell out no signaling in the basic Alice-Bob case. So it comes down to a bunch of equations. So I just label with letters all the, all the entries in such a table. Uh, and to say that we have consistent marginals is just to say that, uh, for example, the probability for Alice getting uh, outcome zero um, uh, between the two contexts where she can do the measurement A should be the same whether we're in this context, 
so the outcome zero is C plus E, or whether it's in this context, so the, 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 the probabilities for these outcomes are K plus M. So saying that those two marginals coincide is exactly saying that this equation holds. And there's a similar bunch of equations for all the other cases where you fix a measurement and um, look at the marginals. Now, if we, uh, if we relate that to, you can check that these conditions are satisfied by the Bell table. And if we, if we were to go back to the PR box, remember the PR box has um, entries 1, 0, 0, 1 for the first three rows and then 0, 1, 1, 0 for the last row. So really you can see, for example, that in the PR box, C, uh, the E is 0 and the M is 0. So, so the first equation is telling us that this entry equals that. And if you play through all the equations, in the PR box it's telling you that all the values have to be the same. Uh, so um, that directly proves that the PR box, the support of the PR box, given that it satisfies no signaling, uniquely determines the probability distributions. And uh, in fact, they have to be the uniform distribution on every row. Uh, and this is a general, uh, a general fact about the, the, these extremal cases of um, uh, strong contextuality. Okay, so having set up this general framework, we can now define uh, what um, contextuality means in general. So we have an empirical model on a measurement scenario, and we say that it's non-contextual. There is a classical explanation. If there is a distribution on all the variables, which marginalizes to give us back the observed probabilities for every context. Uh, which is, uh, um, uh, in geometric terms, is saying we can glue all the local information together into a global consistent description from which all the local directly observable information can be recovered. And we call such a thing a, a, a global section because of this geometric uh, um, uh, way of looking at it. So that's, if such a thing does exist, which is really saying there's a classical source, there's a, there's a um, um, consistent description of all the variables independently of which ones we actually measure, which is consistent with everything that we observe, then the model is non-contextual. And if no such section exists, the empirical model is contextual. And the import of Bell's theorem and similar results is that there are empirical models arising from quantum mechanics, which are indeed contextual. And uh, uh, just to recap now at the general level, um, there's... Um, uh, well, there's various cl interesting classes of empirical models that arise. So a particularly important one, of course, from our point of view, is those empirical models which are quantum realizable. That is, we can find quantum states and local observables which generate exactly the family of distributions. Um, and um, I should say that, that uh, we'll in, in the next lecture, we'll look just enough into the formalism of quantum mechanics to see how that formalism generates these kind of tables. You can actually compute them uh, for given states and observables. It turns out that all quantum realizable models are compatible, and, and it's the general form of this principle of no signaling. However, there are compatible uh, no signaling empirical models which are not quantum realizable, and the PR box is the example we have so far of that. And so we get these, this natural stratification into a strict hierarchy of three classes. The non-contextual models, those for which there is a classical source, those generated by quantum mechanics, and the, the broad class of no signaling models, still compatible with relativity, but containing things that, as far as we know, are not physically realizable. Of course, there's a very natural question. Why aren't these extra no signaling models physically realizable? Why does nature select the quantum set and no more? And there's been a lot of attempts to find sort of plausible principles that would hit exactly the quantum set, uh, reconstruction theorems of various kinds. And I think it's fair to say that, that nobody feels the last word has by any means been said on that subject. So, so did you give us a precise definition of quantum? I'm going to do that in the next lecture. Yes, I haven't done that yet, but I will do it in the next lecture, yes. 
Uh, but as I say, the, the sort of general idea is, you know, in, in quantum mechanics, ordinary quantum mechanics, you can say what a state is of, on a given dimension of system. It's a, it's a vector or maybe a density matrix on a Hilbert space and um, uh, an observable is another kind of operator and there's a formula, the Born rule, for generating the probability. So we'll see that exactly in the next lecture. But there isn't, there isn't anything that avoids that machinery uh, in, in describing. And, and actually, the issue of describing this class is a very subtle one. And something I'm going to talk about in the next lecture is a very salient open problem, which is whether this class in fixed finite dimensions is decidable. If you can, given a table, you can tell if it is in this class for fixed finite dimensions, even very small dimensions. That is an open question, which seems to be at least quite related to some deep uh, open problems, which is perhaps a deep open problem in itself. OK, so uh, the PR box, as we've already said, satisfies no signaling, but is not quantum realizable. So uh, we can get a natural geometric picture. I mean, let me just bring, we'll say, be seeing more of this later. But we can lay out a table as a vector in a high dimensional real table, uh, real vector space. It's a family of probability distributions. So each such thing can, uh, in, uh, on a finite set, so each such thing can be laid out as a vector of non-negative reals, and we can just concatenate them all, and we get, we get, a, we get a, um, a vector in this high dimensional space. Um, so in a Bell scenario with n parties, k measurements, and L outcomes, this is the uh, dimension. Uh, and of course, empirical models are closed under convex combination, under probabilistic mixing. Uh, so these form a convex set, and in fact, they form a polytope. Um, the fact that they're, that the, well, so, so actually let, let's, um, uh, let's be a little more precise here. The non, -con I mean, we'll see more about this uh, in, a, in a later lecture, but the, the set of non-contextual models form a polytope and the Bell inequalities precisely are the inequalities that define that polytope. The no signaling models, well, we wrote down a bunch of equations in a particular case, and you can generalize that for any scenario, and you can get a system of linear constraints which picks out the no signaling models. So the no, the, the no signaling models, including the PR box, for any given measurement scenario, form a polytope. Um, and of course, that strictly includes the non-contextual models. And strongly contextual models, well, they'll sit either on vertices of the polytope or at least on a face that only contains uh, strongly contextual models. Um, sitting in between these two polytopes is this complicated, subtle set of quantum correlations, which is a convex and closed set, but not a polytope. And the question is, is it a decidable set, as we were saying? And we'll discuss that uh, tomorrow. And I think this picture is related to what, perhaps to Simona's onion, uh, which he will talk about tomorrow. Uh, OK. And, and as I say, the key question is to find compelling principles to explain why nature picks out the quantum set. And that uh, project um, uh, is still an ongoing one in the, in, in the uh, community. Right. So, uh, right. So to finish up, um, so let's, let's just uh, put the definition of the hierarchy of notions of contextuality in this general framework. So given an empirical model, we have the idea of the support of the model. So it's the, all those, all those um, assignments of variables over each context which receives a non-zero probability according to the distribution for that context. So on each context, we get a set of assignments which are regarded as possible, the things that we get uh, an entry one in our support tables or a tick. Um, and if and by us, and, and there's, well, we'll, we'll um, there's a sort of, um, we can descend from probability distributions to supports in a, um, consistent fashion uh, in such a way that if the empirical model is compatible, 
so is the support. So you see that for the support to be compatible is just to say that the set of, uh, that they have consistent marginals in the sense that if you just look at the assignments over one context that are regarded as possible, and then you project down to a smaller context, you're going to get the same set as if you project down uh, from another context. So it's a projection consistency condition, which I think would be familiar in database theory. You're just saying the projections onto a given set of variables is going to be the same, um, um, whichever table you start with that contains all the variables. So the support automatically satisfies no signaling at the level of possibilities. Uh, okay, so, um, right. Now, in, in these terms, we can say that a global assignment, an assignment to all the variables simultaneously, the sort of thing we were looking for diagrammatically with the idea of a univocal path, is consistent with the support of the model if at every context, its restriction or projection down to that context is in the support of the model at that context. And we say that the empirical model is logically contextual, and this is the general notion corresponding to the Hardy type paradox. If some possible joint outcome is not accounted for by any global assignment, in other words, we cannot extend the local section to a global one, which is consistent with the support. So the failure to find this extension to a global assignment is what we call logical contextuality. And notice there's an existential quantifier. If for some local section there's no extension to a, to a global one. Um, and it's saying then that the support of the model cannot be covered by the consistent global assignments. And on the other hand, it's strongly contextual if no uh, local section uh, can be extended to a global one. If, which is to say the support uh, is not consistent with any global section at all. So it's clearly a much stronger condition. And uh, obviously strong contextuality implies logical contextuality. And in fact, we get a hierarchy. Uh, strong contextuality implies logical contextuality, which implies probabilistic contextuality. The Bell model, which we started with, is at the lowest rung of this hierarchy. It's, it's contextual or probabilistically contextual, but not logically contextual. Its support is pretty full, so you can always extend local assignments, global assignments, as far as the support is concerned, but it's the probabilities that form the obstruction to um, having a global section. The Hardy model is logically contextual, but as we saw, not strongly contextual. It does contain some, it is consistent with some global assignment. And the PR box and then um, quantum examples such as the GHZ state is strongly contextual. So we get this strict hierarchy and in fact, we can witness the top level in quantum mechanics with the GHZ state with any number of parties greater than or equal to three um, and various other examples. So in terms of well-known, widely discussed examples in the literature, they turn out to exemplify uh, the different levels of this hierarchy. Okay, so let me just finish up, if I can take a minute, um, by um, just mentioning um, that um, a result and a question, uh, which might be a nice place to stop. So we can lift this hierarchy, which is for models. Now models, um, as arising from quantum mechanics, come from two ingredients, um, which we need to discuss more fully, the quantum states and the quantum measurements, and then you put them together and get, pre um, you get predicted probabilities for the outcomes of the measurements on the states. But um, we can actually lift this to give a way of classifying quantum states in terms of their degree of uh, contextuality. So you can say that a state is strongly contextual if for some choice of local observables for each party the resulting model is strong, is, is, has this property and similarly for logical contextuality. So what we're asking for is um, characterize the multipartite states, the n qubit states, in terms of their maximum degree of contextuality. Um, so um, uh, that's, the, that's the general form of question. So we have a result in this direction, a uh, uh, paper which can be found on the archive with Carmen Constantin and Shengang Ying, 
which shows that the Hardy paradox, which we might think was a very delicate thing that needed to be a very special contrivance with a, a, a sort of some delicate choice of state, uh, actually, this is not the case. With one exceptional class, bizarrely, uh, again showing that the, the sort of bipartite case is a bit special, the, the exceptional class, curiously, are the maximally entangled bipartite states. But for any other n qubit entangled state, which is not just a product of these, these exceptions and single qubit states, that um, we can find local observables which witness a Hardy paradox. Um, and actually, uh, the proof is constructive and provides an algorithm which, given an n qubit entangled state, constructs actually just n plus 2 local observables leading to a logically contextual model. And the, the algorithm is fairly simple, but the proof that it works is, is quite, is quite non-trivial. Um, and this leads to a question which is open and I think would, would um, be very interesting to get an answer to which is to, uh, to answer the question, for which quantum states can we find local observables which give rise to a strongly contextual uh, empirical model? So I think that's quite a challenging uh, problem. Uh, as I've tried to motivate, it makes good sense in a, in a, in a logical sense, but of course it does um, go into the issue of quantum representation. Uh, one can also ask, uh, for which observables can you find states and sort of dualize the question? And there are some results in, in, in those directions. There are actually several directions that one can go in. But I think this, this question in particular would be um, very nice to um, find an answer to. So if anyone has any, uh, any thoughts on the matter or, or indeed anything else that may have arisen in this lecture, I'd be very happy to discuss them. Uh, so I'll finish there. Thanks. Questions now. We have a break. As I say, if anyone wants to know about the connections with uh, topology and sheaves and so on, then please do ask me. I'm not planning to cover them in the in the lectures here.